Hello friends and welcome back to the channel. My name is Patricia and I'm a UX UI designer, innovation designer based in Berlin. So this video is actually a live recording from one of my Instagram live sessions I'm doing on Thursdays. I mean, not every Thursday to be honest, but like from time to time. And this was one with Maureen. Um, maybe you know her from Instagram as UX collection. Um, he so she's sharing a lot of really cool tips um, and resources about UX, about design, about the industry. And we had a very casual and honest chat about the industry. So how it is to work uh, full-time at, at a company, she's working at Zalando, and how is it actually to work as a freelance designer. So I'm a freelance designer, so we compared both sides and shared really honest um, learnings and some things that uh, we would do differently in the future and also a few failures but also tips and tricks for success. So I really hope that this recording is helpful for you, gives you some uh, guide guidelines for your career journey and yeah, helps you on the way. If you have any questions, if you want to know anything, feel free to just share them in the comments and I would say, let's get started with the live stream. Enjoy it. Um, and let's get started with a quick introduction. So for every one of you who might um, not know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and also your story, how you get started with um, your ex. Yeah, cool. So um, my name is Maureen. I'm also living in Berlin, just like Patricia, but I'm not originally from Germany. I'm Dutch. I moved to, the, uh, to Berlin in 2013. And I have been working in UX since 2018, so four years now. Um, before I studied something completely different, I studied art history, I was set on doing a career in art and then I ended up being a designer and currently I'm working at Zalando, I think for the Europeans they probably know what that is, for those who live outside of Europe that is a really big um, online fashion platform kind of um, um, similar to ASOS. I think that is also something that a lot of people know. So yeah, there I'm working as a product designer now for almost a year now. March 1st is my first year anniversary at Salando. Nice. Yeah, congratulations. Very nice. Cool. Yeah, uh, one year goes by super fast. <laughs> and also pretty interesting Especially if you're working and have a lot of things to do, right? Yeah, exactly. then it takes some time. But um, tell us a bit how you, uh, how you uh, were able actually to move from art history to UX. That's a pretty interesting switch. Um, so how did, you, how did you do mm -hmm. that? I'm curious. Although I know a little bit about it. It was uh, not planned. <laughs> so... When I did my master's degree in art history, I um, actually did research on how we can make museums more democratic and have more people access museums and how we can make exhibitions more interesting to people. So I was actually already doing something that goes in the direction of UX design, even though by then I had no clue that UX design even existed. And um, later on, I got a job in marketing. And through that, I got to know more about UX design. And I decided I wanted to work directly with people that are using a product. I want to be more closely to um, yeah, the person that in the end is actually profiting from my work. And I felt like in my marketing job I was uh, not very close to the users because I had no clue who the people were that were the users of the product um, so that's how I, I, I came across UX design um, it was um, back then not very 
popular. So I, I, I googled on and, and looked up what is UX design. And yeah, I, I found one school and I enrolled in that school and that's it. And now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. It's so crazy how this evolved, right? Because um, yeah. Like for me, very similar when I started to move to UX, it wasn't that popular. It was like, what is that? I don't know. And it was very difficult to find good content and information about it. So totally different than today. You know, I wish yeah. I would switch to UX right now. You like such a good time right now. A lot of positions, um, a lot of content, a lot of people to follow, a lot of people to ask for advice and feedback and mentors. So what a good time right now, right, for people. Um, yeah. Yeah, for, yeah, definitely. So there good. is so much out there right now. And I remember when I, um, when I was interested in UX, I didn't even know people that were working in UX. And they kind of seemed like unicorns. I had no clue who was a UX designer. And now there are so yeah. many people that are working in our industry and it's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your ex is awesome. Even if you will decide to do something else afterwards, everything you learned there is something that, you know, stays with you forever. Like mm -hmm. all the tools you can use them for, I, I would say like almost all kind of professions and jobs. So yeah, your ex um, is definitely awesome. Um, so you're in Berlin or in Germany for like a long time, 2013, right? Um, yeah. Maybe you know from friends who are living like far away or like in other countries, um, any kind of differences when it comes to the job market in Germany? Because this is something a lot of people are interested in. They want to mm -hmm. move to Germany because here are a lot of open positions. So when you are applying for a job or maybe when you applied uh, at Zalando, what was... Um, important to know or to understand about like the job market and really landing a position at a really good company like Salandor's in Berlin? I think, um, I mean, I don't know much about the uh, UX design scene in other countries, of course, because I never worked in another country. But what I've noticed with my friends and also when I look at my colleagues at Salando is that especially when you work in bigger companies like Zalando or other international companies, it is way easier to get a job as a foreigner because they actually help you with relocation. The um, language that they speak in the company is English. So that also makes it way easier. And I think that's also the biggest difference that I noticed with my previous jobs, because in my previous jobs, I worked in an agency And especially in the first agency I worked at, they only spoke German. The clients they had were, I can't imagine that. Okay, awesome. Um, so you were just talking about, um, yeah, your job experience actually, like working at an agency and then uh, switching to Correct. Salando. Correct, so exactly. The, the point where we broke up, I was just talking about, um, what it's like if you want to work in Berlin in this case and you come from a different country what the best way to go about it is and I think it is your best bet is um, applying at bigger companies because of two reasons one they help you with relocation and they actually actively recruit also in other countries and um, they oftentimes use English as the language in the company so that also makes it easier for you to get to work because um I, i'm maybe you can also uh, say give your perspective on this patricia but i have the impression that especially with like smaller german companies and specifically they tend to speak more german so the english is not really much of a language that they use so that is definitely something to keep in mind if you want to move to germany that you um, prepare with a language course. I can definitely say that learning the language and now speaking German fluently has helped me tremendously. I would definitely recommend that to anyone that wants to live and work here. Um, but it doesn't mean that it is absolutely necessary because you can also get by without the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, and German is like a pretty difficult language to learn as well so not a fun one um, exactly so, yeah it's for those who yeah, enjoy awesome learning you languages it. you have a good challenge when you move to germany yeah 
But I think like even if you or if you apply like in bigger companies like Zalando or there, there are a few others in, in Berlin or all around Germany, most of the times you only speak English, um, which is pretty and it's it's nice if you speak German for sure. But I had also, um, you know, when I had freelance projects at bigger uh, corporates, everyone spoke English because we had like one person who was like from Brazil or I don't know, um, China or like any country. And then we spoke English and it was fine. Um, because uh, another thing that I think is also pretty interesting, most of the times you have also like the development team somewhere else, like in India, for example, so if you want to, you know, if you want to document anything, you exactly. need to document it in English anyways. You usually do that. I think like even in smaller companies, you usually document everything in English so everyone can read it. Um, and then it's not a really big yeah. step to also speaking English, um, I think. So, yeah, in that case, Germany is definitely a really good uh, company, I think, like also for foreigners to just apply and then um, see how that goes. So um, what is your experience on the you know, um, on the journey of applying for a job. How was that for you? Do you have any tips? Because I know that this is a really big topic and I mm -hmm. don't have a lot of uh, tips on that uh, because I haven't applied on like... Um, uh, for jobs me, yet. it has definitely been a roller coaster. So I think yeah, um, I the imagine. first time when I entered the job market, that was like beginning of 2018. And I think that was a really good time for me to um, start looking for a job because back then there were not that many juniors yet, but there were quite a lot of entry level jobs. So for finding my first job was actually not hard at all. I um, applied for a position at an agency that I really liked and I got a job and that was actually pretty um, yeah, straightforward and went fine. But um, then in the beginning of 2020, I decided that I wanted to take on another challenge. And that time, timing could not have been worse. I would not recommend anyone to start looking for a job next time a pandemic hits the planet. Um, because I looked for a job <laughs> for almost half a year. And by then, I already had like a little bit of experience. And that was really difficult for me um, back then to find something. I also had to just apply for quite a lot of things to even get a reaction back. So it was uh, th that time was completely different. Although I will also say that there were some things that I wasn't doing at the time and that I could have been doing to make it easier. I um, could have spent more time building a more customized portfolio, spending a bit more time really researching what kind of companies I want to work at. But at the time, there were not many positions open because there was a hiring freeze with a lot of companies. So I was just trying my luck as much as I can. Um, so that was, that was difficult then. And when I switched my job last year so beginning of 2021 um I, then it, then it was again easier because people started to hire more people again and what i found was i got um connected or an, an old colleague of mine who works at Zalando reached out to me and asked if i would be interested in working at Zalando so the last job actually wasn't really a job search in the traditional sense but it was more through connections that i got this um, position although i also applied for other companies and that i did through linkedin and the the normal application process but in the end i decided for the position at salando so um what the takeaway from that is is i think you have some control over your job search in the sense of preparing, being intentional with your job search, really think about where do I want to work? How can I adjust my portfolio to that employer that I want to work for? But there is also a big part that you don't fully control. For example, if we're in a pandemic, yeah, it's going to be harder to find a job if the competition is really high. That is also something that you can't fully influence, but you still have to find a way to navigate that then. 
Yeah, yeah, those are such good points, right? Like sometimes things happen and you can control it if you need to find a way. And I think it's also pretty interesting, like what you shared about, like, you know, what you could have done, you know, like reflecting afterwards about like, I didn't do it. I had my reasons to not do it. But next time I probably would do it differently. Yeah. I think this is so, so helpful, right? Because also for us as a generation, it's normal to switch careers like multiple times. So we will apply and reapply over and over again. And sometimes it's like a very difficult application process. And sometimes it's, it's, it's a little bit easier uh, if like you have yeah. someone who works there, then reach out. And um, from my experience, this is like one of the most important things in life and also for your career, if you're a freelancer or if you are working somewhere, have a good network or uh, have friends who know that you, what you are doing. So over and over, explain them what, what you're doing and what you're looking for, what you want. And then opportunities will come to you yeah. just like by default. Because they, you know, they want to work with you if something comes up and they understood what UX is and something, you know, like they're, they're looking for a freelancer or like a full-time position UX person. They're like, oh, wait, I know someone. Yes. I will recommend them. You know, most people are happy to, I also, everyone is happy to do that, I feel. So, um, yeah, that's definitely a very important um and yeah, I think I really thing. underestimated um, that also. I think it's really good that you mentioned that the importance of a network because in the beginning, I, I didn't really say, saw myself as a networking person. I was like, oh, I need to go to all of these events and super awkward and talk with all these awkward people. But networking is really just like, more like connections, like really connecting with peers on yeah. similar interests and when you go about it more in the sense of making friends and like just building out your social circle, so many more opportunities come your way. And yeah, it just, like you say, it just goes naturally. Yeah. 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 Um, so true. I think this is such an interesting misconception yeah. of networking, right? Because like, I'm like, say with you, I hate this like small talk with strangers, like on a meetup or so, I hate that. But as soon as I feel like a connection or like if someone could be a friend yeah. as well, then it's like so easy and natural. So I think it's for most people very similar. So seeing that from the beginning like that, it's, it's easy because you don't need to talk to anyone. You don't need to, you know, at any, at everyone you see on LinkedIn or build a connection. If you don't feel that connection, yeah. I think that you don't really need to exactly. get deep on it if you don't want to. So, so is that the way that simple. you get uh, your um, clients through your connections? Mm -hmm. Most of the times, yes. Um, I also got some questions before from someone who said, like, it's so difficult to find projects. Um, I feel like, yeah, it can be a little bit difficult to find good projects, but most of the times, people also who I know reach out to me. Either I know them from school, I know them from work, I have worked with them somewhere, and they're friends of someone I met, I met them at a conference, you know, all those people, um, and at some point, if an opportunity pops up, they will reach out to you if they like you, and most importantly, if they think you are like easy to work with. Of course, they need to believe in your, in your work and that you know what you're doing, but also they need to, because they will work with you probably, so they need to, yeah. they need to want working with you. And there are a lot of people who I actually don't want to work with, but the people that are easy to work with are the, I would say like the people who will get a lot of opportunities um, in their way because those people are just really great and not that easy to find most of the time. So. Um, yes, that's definitely the way how I um, got into it. And also when I switched, so I had a, a full-time position first. Mm -hmm. So I started at an agency. And then I had like a little bit similar like you, the, this moment where I was like, I need a new challenge. Um, I already started to do freelance projects on the side, which got a little bit like out of control and way too much. So I was working on the weekends and after work. And then at some point I switched to freelance um, 100%. So I quit my uh, full-time position and I moved to freelance. And although I already had clients lined up, it was like a very scary situation for me because um, I really like security and 
um, like also moving to freelance is not something that like your family or friends would recommend you. They, you know, uh, I feel like most people are like, no, you know, you have a good mm. job, like father, you know, keep that and don't take that risk. So I was definitely very nervous in the beginning and um, had a lot of doubts, but it kind of um, got away from like through the time. Um, it was actually not that difficult to find clients and also working with them and um, structuring your own life and work life was not as difficult as expected. And I got a lot of challenges, with, which I was mm -hmm. facing in my full-time position back then. Not an all full-time position, but where I was working uh, for sure. So I think for me, the switch um, definitely makes sense. Um, and the second thing, uh, when it comes to finding uh, freelance projects is definitely um, having like some kind of like mm -hmm. an online appearance. Because I would say like for me, it's like, 30 percent is coming from like my network or maybe 40 percent is coming from my network of people i know and the other really big chunk and those are actually most of the times like even the projects that are you know like better paid and more interesting for me are coming mm -hmm. through my social networks so most of the times through instagram which is crazy um so a lot of people finding me on instagram then um they some kind of promote me inside their team and recommend me to hire as a freelancer and then like the whole process starts but I think like the first step comes like at least for me through social networks and although I'm not like crazy active on Instagram or so but like even having an appearance there and helping people to understand what you're doing and how your process looks like because hiring a freelancer can be very scary right like you're paying them like huge amount mm -hmm. of money and you don't know what they're doing can you trust them and this is like so much about trust uh, i also feel that when i'm working with freelancers i'm like yeah do they know what they're doing you know when i'm paying them a lot of money so i want to be sure that they're knowing um what they're doing and i think um having the online like credibility also through like articles you write um Instagram, for example, or being an active member on LinkedIn really builds that credibility and trust what client really needs because we know what we are doing and they just need to trust us. So I think um, this is definitely the second thing, uh, which is especially I think when you're working freelance, a little bit more important than you're working at a full-time position, although it, I mean, uh, it's never really a bad thing um, to be active there. You're also pretty active on um, Instagram and on socials, um, which is for sure a good thing because you never really know what happens. Your personal brand stays forever. And um, also if you decide to reapply, I don't know, in 10 years somewhere else, then um, it would still be nice for other companies exactly. to see and what I you're doing Exactly. And I actually think it's side. really good that you mentioned this online presence because I think even though for freelancers, even more like a way to generate new clients or generate leads to new clients. I think also when you are not working as a freelancer and actually when you're a beginner in UX and you're trying to break into this job market that we just said can be very competitive. I think that online, having an online presence can be such a big um, differentiator for you. You know, that can really make you stand out of the crowd. So even when you're still beginning, I think it's also really cool whenever I st stumble into like these tiny Instagram profiles from like UX beginners and they're sharing their early work. I think that's so cool. And I wish I did that before as well so that you can also look mm -hmm. back on it later and kind of treat it like a, um, like a journal, like a journey where you can see like, oh, this is where I'm coming from. And even these things is where other people can learn from or it can motivate them also to see that there are other, others that go through the same thing. So I can, I think in any way, if you are interested in building some kind of online presence on regardless what platform, I think that's also always a good thing to do. Yeah, I agree. Um, 100%. Uh... I also didn't share anything in my early career, I think, but it would be nice to look back on it. Um, and also like use that as um, you know, a platform where you yeah. start connections. I don't know about you, but I met so many people on Instagram and people I have, yeah, would have exactly. never met in real life. 
I mean, maybe at some point, but now they're like exactly some kind of friends, I would say, you know, like I ask them for advice. Um, I, I reach out to, to them and yeah. like really feel inspired by them. Um, so I think that's very magical also with like social networks sometimes. There are some downsides, but definitely. Also, I, I think, think that's the biggest, the biggest win is because. that you get a whole bunch of new. Yeah, you have like official work colleagues who are the colleagues at your company but i also feel like i have some kind of like unofficial work colleagues and those are the people i met through instagram that <laughs> we also like chat about our careers yeah. and they can give advice and i think that is so so valuable to have yeah exactly exactly right um because this is um I think um, your ex goodies, she's, she also has like a really big Instagram account and um, shared a post, I think like last week or so about having a mentor or something. And I think this was pretty interesting because it really get, like, kept me thinking about um, the whole process of feedback and learning. And I think, you know, any kind of connection that you're having, any kind of conversation and feedback is some kind of like a mentoring process. And especially if you're young, and if you have the opportunity to really talk to people who are a little bit like where you want to be in a few years, this is also some kind of like a mentoring. So you don't need to have like this one person that you meet like once a week. Mentoring can look so different and you really need to like soak it in yeah. and get the most out of it and I think this is so interesting um I think yeah, I'm, about, I'm um, really really happy that you also. say that because I think that's the biggest misconception that people have that a mentor is this one master that you look up to and that one person that needs to for always um, hold your hand and, and lead you and that's not the case I think anyone that like you say is three steps ahead of where you want to be and any kind of conversation can give you advice. It can also just be someone from a different job role that can help you with that. And I think that when you approach, approach yeah. mentorship like that, it's also easier to find what you're looking for. Because I, I feel like mentorship is really kind of shown as you have to have this one coach, but you don't. You can use multiple p connections again we, we we come back to connections again that's what it all is about yeah 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 um totally um and i feel i think it is also important for everyone who's listening who's thinking about moving to freelance you won't have any colleagues you can ask for advice um you won't have um like a creative director or any manager you can ask for advice so you don't have that anymore not at all so you need to already if you think about that look for people you can ask for advice because otherwise you will annoy like, your partner and your friends with it and sometimes it's okay but most of the times they also don't know how to solve that so i think this is very very important to think about and this is also i think in the beginning and i moved to freelance like the biggest challenge for me was like not having the colleagues I can ask for feedback, not having the colleagues I can discuss UX topics because as a UX designer, you love that, right? Like talking about like tiny usability things um, discussing like two options um, doing research together and testing. And if you don't have that, you will definitely miss that. So you need to re replace that somehow. And it also can be, I think like connections you're having online. I just wanted to say that. Um, and a little bit of a topic switch, but I think a very interesting question uh, from one of the uh, community members. Someone asked, um, how do you start a new project or a new task, both for like freelance and for um, like a full-time position? I think it's very different. So I'm super curious to hear how that is for you as a, like in a full-time position. So when you get a new task and um, a, a new opportunity um how do you get started what is the process there maybe you can i talk think a little about uh, one of the big benefits of working full-time is that that question is already kind of answered for you because when you work in a company they have their own design processes in place so at zalando they have their own product development cycle or their own um, design process and that's the process that I'm working with it within that framework I'm working and I'm working closely together with project managers who are responsible for 
setting the whole project up for um, coming, writing down the business rationale for defining the scope for making sure that we have all the resources when it comes to research or engineering. So um, the, the person that um, helps me set up the project is the project manager, which means that I don't really have to do much in that sense. I only have to uh, do my product design work. And I think that's, I see as one of the biggest benefits as a full-time employee, you have a lot of people around you who take parts of the product development cycle and are responsible for that you so you don't have to do everything on your own and i can imagine that as a freelancer that looks a little bit different right yeah it looks very different yeah this this wow this sounds awesome like everything you just mentioned um it's very different as a freelancer, I would say. Um, although I would honestly a little bit differentiate between um, freelance projects where I am, uh, you know, part of where I am getting in as one of like a replacement for someone in a bigger team. This is also something that sometimes that happens that we have a proper researcher, that we have a like um, a project manager or someone who really takes care of it and just as an external person, like uh, being a part of that team. Then it's very similar to what you described. Sadly, this doesn't really happen much. Most of the time, it's just me. So a client reach out, reaches out and um, says like, yeah, um, most of the time like, we need your X support. And then um, it starts with, okay, what kind of support do you need? Um, I usually start with some kind of like an intro call uh, where I don't charge anything for. So we just get to know each other and see um, if we can work together, what they, you know, want to get out of the project, uh, if they're like, how's the budget? Um, and yeah, what they expect from me. So uh, timeline, all those kind of things that I need to know before I can say even yes to that. And then um, we usually start with some kind of like a strategy workshop. Um, this is something I, I already charged for. So this is like, um, a usual workshop to get started where I don't really know exactly what the client needs. So we will figure that out in that workshop, but this is not only about like figuring out the project scope, but also understanding like a little bit of everything that happened in the past and where this company or this, pr this project is heading to in the future. So a little bit about future goals as well. And after that, um, I, need to think about uh, what resources do I need? Um, do we need research? Um, is there anything um, that needs to done needs to be done very urgently? How is the timeline? How can I structure like the project? Do I need to involve other freelancers? And does that align with the budget? This is also something that I that I didn't need to see, like what is their budget? And does that align with uh, what I would charge for it? And then get started. So I think like, especially the beginning is a, like a crucial point because you need to figure out what they want, who's responsible, uh, what they expect from you and um, what is really important in that project. And if you don't do that right, the project won't go well because you really need to understand that otherwise um, expectations are different. So a very crucial point, um, very important point and um, I would recommend that to every freelancer or to everyone who's thinking about really working with clients, start with some kind of discovery period where you really try to understand what the client needs before you think about any solutions. Because otherwise you might get lost in between and um, both parties are not really happy about um, the collaboration and then you call them bad clients, although mm -hmm. they just didn't know what they wanted in the beginning, so you needed to help them, right? Like most people, clients, who are not a UX manager, they can't articulate what they need. So you really need to help them. So this was, I think, like the biggest learning also for me to always start uh, with a discovery period and, and, and also charge for it. How is that? So um, what do, do you look me. out for then? How do you um, estimate if a client would be a good match for you or not? What are like red flags that you can take out in those early stages where you think, okay, this is not someone that I want to work with? Yeah, um, that's actually a really good question um, because I just had um, like one um, one client I worked with, I think like 
few months ago and we had like a first call went super well very interesting i think uh, was really aligned with um, what i could provide what they were needing uh, needed uh, what they were needing we always had a discovery um and we had a discovery workshop uh, and there we talked about um expectations um also like the budget uh, timelines um responsibilities and any kind of like expectation when it comes to mm -hmm. the project, also to my work, what they need, when and where. Um, so for me to kind of like build packages for them to prepare. And within this workshop, um, like several topics arise where I felt um, it doesn't really like line up. So this is like very difficult for me to do like time wise and uh, to um, like, really support them in the long term because I'm just like not the right person for that they were looking for more like a graphic designer basically they didn't know that they thought they're looking for your ex person but actually they were looking for a graphic designer um I can't blame them because like how should they know but um yeah after the workshop I just we, we talked about everything and um, I recommended them to do a few steps but I couldn't continue working with them because I just wasn't the right person for it very helpful if I would have skipped that part, the discovery part in the beginning, really understand what they need and their problem. I probably would have worked with them, provided like great UX input, but they were, probably wouldn't have been happy with it, would have paid a crazy amount of money for it and actually rather need like someone who just visualizes some ideas because they were like mm -hmm. very early in the process. Um, so I think um, this was um, like a really interesting story also for me to always realize, keep going with this discovery phase because it's helpful. And because I feel in that workshop or in that, in like in those calls in the beginning, you realize, is it a match? What do they expect? Mm -hmm. And can you deliver it? Because sometimes clients uh, expect something that you can deliver. I also don't know any, like, all the, I don't have all the skills in the world. There are some things that I just can't do. I'm not good at it. And mm -hmm. sometimes I also don't want to do it. So I try to be very honest about it in the beginning um, and not say yes to all the clients, but rather say no and then be happy about it because also know um, how uh, projects can really end up where you are not 100% in line. So this can always happen if you really skip that first uh, uh, phase yeah. because urgent like they need something tomorrow so don't say yes to anything like that um and I always talk about like you know how can you use um, the project afterwards how you're um, involved in the long term and then you you know you sometimes and then you really get a sense for how pe how people really how they are and how it will be to work with them um because this is also i think pretty interesting um if you after that, after like the first three or three calls, if they still don't trust you, if they still um, don't really trust in your work and what you're providing, yeah. them, it's probably not the right right fit. So they're probably looking for something else. And I think it's also pretty important um, because um, yeah, this is it's something you just learn. I think in the first calls, you really see with all kind of you know we talked about networking in the beginning, and then sometimes you really feel like this is a good match. Like it will be fun working with them. I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to have calls with them. I, you know, that will be exciting. That will be a good thing. And sometimes you feel like this is, this is uh, just yeah. um, won't work. Even though the project and might I be, think might that's be pretty also, interesting. Um, that yeah. also goes to show that the skills that we have as designers don't only apply to users, but also to clients. You can use the same skills that you use to do user research for client research and really understand what are the needs of the client and how can we find a balance there or how can we work together in that yeah 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 that's a good point um same with colleagues or with everyone um with some people you work uh, together like perfectly and with some people it's just a little bit more difficult and and if you especially with clients who are not trained to know how to behave and um, also sometimes with um, designers or your accidents like, that sounds a little bit rude right but you know what I mean so they just don't they have like a hard time to articulate what they need and what they want um, so I think yeah it's 
definitely important that you're also willing to explain them and help them but i think that's also that an important uh, task for designers yes. regardless if you're a freelance or a full-time because i also uh, noticed that working as a full-time designer that a, an important part of your responsibilities is educating stakeholders clients whoever about design and and making them familiar with our practices and that takes patience and time but when you get to that point it's actually really important because you want them on your team so to say on your side yeah yeah th yeah that's true um because i think for us it's so clear right like it, it made just makes total sense we have done like processes and things like one million times but for people who are new to that we just need to explain it and in the language that they understand with the words that they need with i would say like you know people who are a little bit more um, business focused exactly. they want some data they don't care about like um, the interviews uh, we had and any emotions they want some data they need that mm -hmm. because they have stakeholders their manager who need the data as well so i think yeah i can recommend mm -hmm. a really awesome book about that and it's called articulating design decisions let's see if i can find it here somewhere mm -hmm. uh, no i think it's in my office um awesome book i've, uh, I've you, seen it i have it on already. my list but it's from uh, o'reilly right <laughs> yeah yeah they have so many cool books yeah, yeah. I, yeah i've seen the cover It's an awesome book. I can highly recommend it. I think like the first chapter is a bit boring, but after the second chapter, it's awesome uh, because it exactly explains what you mentioned, like educate them. Um, how can you really convince and help people to understand that your design makes sense? Yeah, something like designers definitely have a hard, most of the times like a really hard time doing that. So cool. It goes on the reading la mm. list. <laughs> the, the long list, never right? like my list is so long <laughs> never ending yeah that's true but it's also good um because it shows like education never stops also for us if um if i want to get clients or even for you if you want to be successful education is a very um important part um i think also would be interesting how you um deal with it at Salando or at a full-time position. Um, do you have any like opportunities for external education or conferences? Exactly. Or how that so work? in all the companies that I've worked with so far, also at Salando, we have a training budget that you can actually use for education, but we also have internal trainings. So like uh, how to write proper user research briefs or some, or how to facilitate workshops. So we both have internal and external uh, trainings or training possibilities. And I would say that if you have the opportunity, always use it, always use that training budget. Um, because like you said, you, you have to keep on educating yourself. And I think what's really good there is also to learn about yourself. What's the best way for you to learn? Because for me, I found through the years that reading books is something that doesn't stick much with me when i read a book i'm like okay interesting now i forget about it so i really try to do a lot of trainings that are interactive and where you have videos and where you're like filling out exercises and doing things because then i really yeah train that muscle so to say um but how do you do that as a freelancer i guess you have to all do that in your free time right yeah that's a good point uh, although it's interesting because like i'm totally the opposite i love books mm -hmm. where i'm taking back like, the most out of it's it's crazy for me like reading a book and making notes and stuff i, I can remember mm -hmm. almost everything but with training sometimes i feel a bit overwhelmed with like all the activities and then um many things going on and for me it's really like difficult sometimes to focus on that uh, you know when you have like training somewhere so it's a bit difficult but like you said you need to figure out what really works for you and then go in that direction you can still do other things right but knowing how you want to learn yeah. is like the best and will like push you forward in your career for sure so um how i did that yeah it's definitely a challenge because you um first of all you need to pay it for yourself and um, so all the conferences 
makes sense, right? Like who should pay for it? Um, uh, you need to pay for it uh, yourself and you also can work during that time. So what I'm usually doing is when I have some like um, time between projects, then I'm taking a course, um, like any kind of course that I think is interesting. It could be an online course or something like that, um, which is for me a little bit easier than the, like mm -hmm. the on-site courses. They're a little bit more difficult for me to really focus and get something out. So I think like online works pretty well for me. And to be honest, I'm not doing that like super often, maybe like two a year or something like that. And the rest of the year is mostly books. And this is where I'm getting the most, like really the most out of a lot of podcasts um, during work, especially and also some YouTube videos here and there, but I wouldn't really call this education this mostly when I'm Googling something and then want to look any kind of things up. Um, but yeah, um, this is definitely, I think, like a, like a big topic that you also need to figure out because yeah. things are changing all the time um, and you need to keep up to date. Reading books is great, but this won't be enough. You also need to read articles uh, and need to really interact with like, people around you to get the latest news and see what's going on. I think another really great source of like inspiration or content is LinkedIn for me. Um, I'm following a few really interesting people there, and they are also always sharing like great articles and content that I'm trying to read before I start my work day so like the first 15 to 20 minutes or so i'm just like going through articles and see what's interesting and sometimes i'm sharing them on uh, instagram here as well um but that's important like having a routine where you're continuously learning i feel like after work it's very difficult for me but like before work it's a little bit easier and then see yeah yeah what really sticks with you um for me the best is books um yeah but then also like taking notes marking everything and writing like some kind of like a summary otherwise exactly. you forget about it like at least me yeah so you need really need to put some work in it which makes it less fun but and i so think that's also what end. um there is so much information out there in so many different platforms that i think is also not only important to know what the best way for you is to learn but also kind of focus your learning so there are some things that are very good to really have that knowledge but there are also a lot of things where it is good if you know where to find the information instead of like trying to suck everything up because that is just not possible so what i try to do is like the things that um are important for me to know for the direction that i want to progress in those are that's knowledge that i actively try to learn and memorize and um, apply and then other things that are more like neighboring areas of knowledge I just try to understand okay that's where I can find that information if I would need it but I would not actively like try to read everything there is about that because yeah that's just <laughs> impossible such a good point honestly that's super important like really filtering content Otherwise, you feel so overwhelmed. Um, that I think it's also like a really big problem nowadays. Like because wherever you go, also Instagram, it's filled with content and education, and you don't can, you can't remember it. But you feel really overwhelmed from like all the content. Do you need to remember it? Like knowing all the five design library platforms, or knowing like all the typographies or research methods. If you're not a researcher, like mm -hmm. should you really know it? Probably not. If you're interested in it great but like you said save it somewhere um in a doc if you want to look it up awesome but rather really focus on the things that really excite you because even you act there are some things that i'm like not enjoying at all i hate it so yeah i try to like not do it that much um and so i probably won't read about yeah. it because like i don't want to do it at all so um i think very important for everyone really focus on what are you excited about? What are you enjoying the most? And, and then reading and also education, I think, comes very natural and very easy your way as well. Yeah, I would exactly. Say. Not yeah, forced that's a good much. one. Yeah. Okay. I will um, have a um, look at the questions. I think this is also... Oh, I can show the questions again. I don't know 
why. Um, but one question was um, uh, in your in your career. Let me read it out. So, do you recommend a beginner people may work as freelancers or having a full time position? What <laughs> I can only about? answer that out of a full time position because I never worked as a freelancer. Um, but the reason why I did not choose to start working as a freelancer as a beginner is because I uh, didn't want to overwhelm myself with trying to find clients and doing all these things next to just setting the first, making the first steps in my career. And what I really um, found important in the beginning of my career was to be surrounded by more experienced designers that I could learn from, that um, could teach me something. And the reason I chose an agency because that I was very sad on. I really wanted to work in an agency in the beginning. And that was because I would then have the opportunity to work on many different projects. So I still had that variety that you would have as a freelancer. But at the same time, the security and the team that really helps kickstart your career. So my case would be become a full-time designer but i think maybe you see that differently now <laughs> to be honest i mm, see oh, it okay. exactly the same because i also started as a bit of with a full-time position and i think for me it was also the best um like i i you know i agree with everything you said you get so much support if you're working full-time somewhere you can learn so much from the left and right you have always someone you can ask for help you have a lot of experience and I personally would recommend moving to freelance at a point where you feel very, very confident with your work and what you're doing because you don't get like the same appreciation. Like you don't have anyone who takes care of you. You don't have anyone you can ask for help. It sounds like all so bad right now. Um, it's not, it's, 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 it's awesome to work as a freelancer, but I think you need to be, you need to know that it's, you are alone from that point on, and you don't have any help. So I would recommend that to everyone who's more like really feeling like a senior, who's presenting design and stands 100% behind it, who can um, explain every decision they made and who has a lot of experience. If not, then you will have re really have mm -hmm. like, a, like a really hard time working with clients and projects because they will ask questions and then you're like, I don't know why I did that. Um, so rather have a lot of experience and get everything you can out of the experience working full time, learning the methods, learning all the processes, asking a lot of questions, like getting education budget. So really like, you know, like soaking it all in. And then you have so much experience that freelance will be very easy for you. Not, not talking about like the network you build for working somewhere, especially in an agency because you met so many people. But yeah, this would definitely be my recommendation so don't start working freelance for sure it will be such a hard time for you I feel depends of course right but a few years of experience are great like senior level I think is needed and most of the clients that I know um, are looking for like a senior I think it's person. also because they want to have that trust that Depending. this one person can um, run everything on their own right mm-hmm yeah, that's pretty important um, thing also for yourself because I don't know how that is, but if you really start as a junior, I don't know about like the people who are listening here or about you, Maureen, but I had no idea about anything. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to like, which methods. Of course, it came like after time, but yeah. I just didn't know many things and I needed to ask questions and I made like maybe bad decisions and things that were, didn't didn't work out but yeah it was not a problem at all right because like i had people who back uh, did me back uh, back up me have who helped me and then after like a month and month you learn yes. so much also sort of failures where you are lost and sad and don't know what you're doing and um uh, things like that um that you really get um, I like think that's also that really need, good yeah. that you say that I um, had the exact so. same thing like in the beginning I was like the the thing is what you learn about UX and then actually working as a UX designer or, or any designer I think those are two different things because what you learn is 
ideal and like the ideal design thinking process and ideally when we would have all the money and the time we would be doing these methods but that's not how the reality looks like in the reality there's never time there's never money everything needs to be done yesterday so yeah. to then start working in an environment that also cuts you some slack and that is forgiving when you mess up that is so valuable to have like a supporting team around you and knowing that you can make these mistakes and i would also um i think that's if you can manage to make a lot of mistakes as a junior that's then you're doing everything well because from all of these mistakes you learn and i think yeah if i could tell myself my, like my junior UX designer self something, I would say make as many mistakes as you can because now you can. Like not, you're, you're there, people know that yeah. you don't know everything and that's also fine. So yeah, use the support yeah. that you have around you. Yeah, you will never have that again, right? So it's only in the beginning, <laughs> exactly. it won't come back. Which is crazy, right? Like it, it exactly. Won't come back. Now, I Never. mean, I think like, it also depends on the company. I still feel comfortable if I would make a mistake, but I can't make rookie mistakes anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how how that changed. But I think it should also be a motivation for like juniors who are listening. Um, it's totally normal if you feel um like you're doing mistakes or if you don't know what you're doing at some point that's normal like i feel like everyone went through that and yeah i mean that's totally normal yeah um another interesting topic um i got was um was um around mm -hmm. um salaries mm -hmm. and rates and i think this is also pretty interesting for uh, many people maybe you Uh, can talk a little about like how um, was especially talking about like your salary how did they make you an offer or um, how did you know what you can ex like get and expect I know it's very different for agencies and companies so how did that go for you because I imagine it's it is difficult, difficult and you I mean in my case I only find found out in hindsight that I could have negotiated better when I started but That's also when you're just breaking into an industry and you know nothing, then you don't know what, sh what you should ask. So the way I went about it is I talked yeah. with people that were already working as a UX designer and just asked them, like, what do you think I should be asking with my experience and my skills? What do you think is a fair um, salary to ask for? You can also uh, check out... I think it's called UX salaries or UX designer salaries.com. And they have like a whole overview. Uh, you can check sites like Glassdoor. Sometimes on LinkedIn, they also give a range. But I think the best way is try to inform you yourself about the like your area, because what you earn in Berlin is completely different from what you would earn in Paris or Los Angeles or wherever. So really focus on the area where you want to work in. Reach out to people. Just ask them up front, like, hey, um, are you, do you feel comfortable talking about salary? How much did you make? How much do you think would be a good um, starting price for me? And then the more I progressed in my career, the better a feeling I got for it. And also the more I felt comfortable um, with a certain asking for a certain amount of money because I knew I could then back it up with knowledge that I had the skills I had having talked with colleagues. Um, so I think in the beginning, it's always just really difficult. It's just like <laughs> a shot that you have to hope that people um, are a bit fair with you. Um, and the thing that yeah. I can fully recommend is... Um, be open about it talk with your colleagues about salaries talk about money try just break that comp and um, that discussion open um, and be transparent about it because i think that's only we yeah we can all profit from that when we are more honest about that yeah yeah i agree and um, so so it's also important to really be open and talk about it and um, same in freelance i feel um And I can also totally relate. Um, I mean, I started an agency and had the same um, topic. 
I had no idea what I could earn. I know that I had no experience in it and I couldn't really provide a lot of value back then. Um, so I just, yeah, tried to negotiate a little bit, but it was also, uh, I started in agencies and an agency salaries are usually much lower than in corporates. It yeah. makes all the sense, but I think it's good to know. It can be like 20% or maybe even more lower. It's like a, like a really big difference. Um, and uh, you also really need to negotiate because it's a little bit more difficult to really find the salaries also online. And for corporates, and like you said, there are some websites um, that share salaries. And I also find a really interesting website um, last week. I forgot the name, but there you can see exactly what the different ah, yeah. levels um, I think earn it's called levels dot FYI. You know this, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. This is such a cool website where you see like even you can filter it by location, uh, by experience, um, all those kind of things. So I think this is really awesome to yeah. get a feeling of what you could earn and then see if that still makes sense for yeah. you but like at least exactly. a range and that's also a good point what you mentioned yeah. with um that at corporates you earn or you can earn much more than in an agency i think the two you can also not really compare um i still think that doesn't mean you should never give agencies a, a chance because i think they come with a lot of their own benefits like the variety of clients the possibility to try out new industries so um, even though they might not pay that well, the benefits might come in a different direction, but it is good to keep in mind, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, this is so important to keep that in mind because I also feel like, and I also like make decisions like, in that direction, money is not always money, but sometimes you get like the benefits are so much more worth than the actual money. Um, like, especially in your 20s or when you start your career, money shouldn't be an issue for you. You shouldn't really focus on money. You should focus on your education. So make sure that you learn as much as you can, meet as much people as you as you can, like build your network, uh, get projects that you can uh, also place in your portfolio that you're able to share, that you can talk about. And this will, you know, kickstart your career. This will really push you forward. And this will make sure that you will get yeah. a high salary in a few years. Not in the beginning. You don't need that, right? Like really rather focus on the, your education, especially in your 20s. Um, put all your money there and then yeah. the salaries are coming like, just naturally because like, you know what you're doing. You have a lot of experience, network. Yeah. And um, also in UX, you see that if you check out the Levels website, salaries can be pretty high if and you I have the experience and the education. When it's crazy the best times i found to really get that salary increase is whenever you change the job because when you're working within a um, agency or a corporate you kind of have to to climb that ladder those different levels that they provide you that come with a certain uh, salary range but when you switch your job you have like a, a chance to renegotiate completely and then you can just put your numbers in really high and, and just take a gamble, of course. I mean, it has to be an, an, yeah. an educated guess, not like some, some wild shot. But um, yeah, I think that's also, if, if, if that is something that is important to you, I would say that um, ch changing jobs are always a good opportunity to renegotiate your salary. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um... That's, I think, super, super important. Um, also, like, the, the bigger the company, the more you know, they're probably able to earn. Um, I think you are able to earn. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, what I think doing some research on it can really provide you um, as well in the long term. So I think, um, yeah, pretty important. And also the location. Um, salaries in Berlin, for example, are pretty low compared to Munich or Zurich, um, or Paris. So, yeah, but also living is much cheaper. So it correlates kind of, um, yeah. So for freelance, it's, um, a bit, di so it's a bit different. Um, and I usually charge per day because that's for me like the easiest when, especially when I'm working with 
clients a little bit longer. But I also had projects where I just charge a certain like amount of money. And there it depends like for me when I'm charging on the timeline. Um, also how exciting and interesting is the project. So how much it is really aligned with my goals and where I want to be, like how much fun I will have. If it's, for example, for me, like building a design library, then I would pay like, I would charge like a crazy <laughs> amount of money because I hate doing that. I feel you. <laughs> um, yeah. But there are people who are really enjoying that and rather they take the job then than us. Uh, yes. Um, and also for me, it's, this is very uh, important if I can use the project later and share that in my portfolio or don't. And there are many projects where I, I worked with and I can show anything. It's okay, but I would really love to like show the case study, talk about it and use that baby for... Um, online presence educate about that so i think this is like a very important uh, topic for me as a freelancer and really makes the price um because like the less um the less feeling of i'm charging or i'm changing time with like with work so i'm only giving them my time um the more i am also flexible uh, with the price although I, of course, have a range and I um, can go below a certain uh, point. But in the end, um, I think what is important is to really charge a lot for projects that you don't really want to take on a crazy amount. And if they say yes, then you can still look for another freelancer <laughs> to take over huge parts of it and uh, keep the rest or so. I mean, you can always do that. But um, yeah, pricing is, I think, like also a very... Uh, interesting topic also for everyone who's interested in a book recommendation um, um i can highly recommend the book uh win without pitching manifesto i read this in the ux book club and i also did a youtube video about the summary it's a, such a good book honestly i really love that it was awesome for everyone who's thinking about um you know starting their own business thinking about becoming a freelancer because this really talks about like the business aspect, how to position yourself, especially in this discovery phase that I talked about, right? Like where you don't want to pitch or send proposals to a client with like, we need, uh, I don't know, like those 10 steps and we charge those uh, amount of money. And then in mm -hmm. the end they say like, we don't take you. But you put a lot of money up front with like preparing the proposal and talking and then you don't get, get anything. So this book really guides uh, everyone uh, about like the process of really convincing a client and um, building trust and becoming an expert. Awesome book. Also good for like salary discussions or something. So uh, I don't know. Could also be maybe interesting. But it's not that big. So even though, for people like me that don't like small. reading, we can still but... read it. Or we can watch your YouTube video, the summary of it. <laughs> Yeah, and I wrote a summary uh, article about it. Like, <laughs> but this is also reading, but like very short. So you you just mentioned sometimes you have projects that you can't show anything of. So how do you deal with how do you build a portfolio as a freelancer when you have done a lot of work but you can't show much? What are the kind of workarounds that you found to then still build a case study? Really good question. Um, so my recommendation, and this works perfectly for me, um, is I did a lot of side projects. Projects where I like redesigned something, rethought something, um, things that were never implemented, but just um, to show the way how I think, how I work, um, and you know, um, treat this project as a real project. Then you can show it online. And the interesting thing is you will see that when you're working uh, as a freelancer, clients don't look for your expertise. They also do that, but most of the times they're looking for someone who does something similar mm -hmm. um, than they're looking for. So for example, if they're looking for like a cooking experience, then they're looking for UX designers who did something similar because it's very difficult to think about the skills or to abstract mm -hmm. another project onto what they're needing. So most of the times they're looking for someone who did something similar. So 
pro recommendation for everyone who has a certain area they're interested in could be like um i don't know it could be design systems or could be um i can design or um i don't know um, new work dashboards or the future of electromobility whatever start with side projects you can do that alone you can do that in a group collaborate build prototypes and go through the whole process and treat it like a real project you can use the case study later and mm -hmm. share it um pe clients will find you and you probably you will get hired for a similar project at least yeah. this actually happened for me which is uh, pretty crazy like for similar project or for several projects that i was working on um just case studies or side projects and then um, clients reached out and said like we want something similar we're working on a similar problem or something like that um, we trust you because you did something similar um, i think that's also a really we'll good opportunity you. to try yeah. out tools or technologies or methods that you would not have the chance of trying out during yeah. your job or during your freelance yeah. work so that you can still gain that expertise and perhaps then find someone that actually wants to pay you for doing that yeah exactly exactly um and especially nowadays there's so many tools and resources and there's nothing better than like trying a new tool or trying something new and get really excited about it and really learn something um, on the way and this is also something that you can still put in your case study like any learnings that you had not with tools for sure right but what worked out, what didn't work out, what could be improved, like also good for clients to see that, like really treat mm -hmm. them as like a mm -hmm. word document, uh, like a work document. Yeah, this definitely makes sense. Oh, I think I will be kicked off the stream, uh, sc sc scream, stream for sure, uh, for, uh, yeah, I think we have a few more minutes. Okay, um, then, then let's maybe now. tackle the last so. question before we get kicked out. Let's see. Um, the thing is, for me, somehow the comments don't load anymore. So I can't see anything that people have been writing or saying. So I'm just hoping that someone's writing something. I can see it. Oh, good. True. Where are the questions? Um, Otherwise, you also had them. a whole list, um, right? You wrote down a lot of questions as well. Oh, I think this is also an interesting question where I get a lot of um, a lot of questions about um, what is your uh, experience with um, like boot camps or courses to really get into um, into UX design. There was a question in the comments from someone who said um, he's forty. Um, is it still uh, is it still a good time to get into UX and really get a full-time position i mean i think not? if you want to change your career it's also what you said in the beginning patricia this whole idea that we're going to have the same job for the rest of our lives is so outdated so if you want a career change i think you should always go after it regardless of where you are or how old you are and the question about boot camps and courses i think um, I mean, I took a course and I will, I would still take a course. I really like that because, and we get back to this point again of how do you learn? I am someone that learns the best if I get a curriculum, if I have a community of people around me, if I have tutors and exercises. So I really liked that approach. That was the best approach for me to learn. So I took a course. But I don't think that enrolling in a bootcamp or a course is necessary to become a UX designer because there is so much information out there right now that you could, you, you could theoretically do everything on your own for free. But that, of course, comes at the cost of time and dis discipline. Eh? You have to be really disciplined then and really invest time in learning all of this on your own. But you have some people that like that and that can do that and then that's totally possible. I think what is important to keep in mind is that regardless if you learn it yourself or if you do a boot camp or a course, what these courses and boot camps do is they give you a strong foundation. They give you an introduction in UX design. They don't turn you into a UX design expert, 
that is something that comes with time, with practice, with um, every everything that you invest in yourself. So these courses can be a really good way to kickstart that career change or, or give you that first step into a new um, in, into a new field. But the same way we wouldn't trust a doctor that did a six week crash course on operating someone's brains. I also think someone that did a six week crash course on a UX, on UX design will know a little bit about UX design, but that's not a UX design expert. Then. And I, I think you have to be realistic about sure. that. And a lot also comes out of you keeping, yeah, you keep on educating yourself. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, well said, 100%. Um, it's practice, uh, a lot of practice um, and takes time, but a good kickstart for sure. So, I mean, there are a lot of boot camps, so check it out. Uh, there are also a lot of free resources, a lot of um, much cheaper courses for just like a few hundred dollars. That's much, much cheaper than a boot camp. And get started with something and see how you like it. If you need that curriculum, if that maybe already was enough for you, there are platforms like Skillshare or Coursera um, where you pay like a fee and you get like a variety of awesome courses there are also co um, college degrees that you can do if that is something that um you're interested in you know you can also just enroll in a university and learn something so yeah there are so many options um i think there was one more question that i also think is pretty interesting like maybe the last one before <laughs> i mean we're still here so if they kick us out we'll see um if what about part-time so i got a question about like that's a part-time so only a few hours per day work for a remote position uh, like a full-time position and for freelance working so, part-time or studying part-time working part-time yeah um, working, phew, working i've ne i've never seen a part-time UX job advertised, although I have to say I also never looked for it, so maybe that's the reason I didn't see it. Um, and most of my colleagues, except for one, work full-time, so I also don't know many um, people that worked in the agency I worked at before, that work at Zalando, and that are part-time designers. I think it's also when when you're an employee you have less flexibility on that because you have yeah your hours but i think when you're a freelancer you have way more freedom in deciding how many hours you want to work exactly if, especially if you're charged per hour then you can decide i'm just working like two hours or three hours a day and then the rest i call it a day and but you also won't get paid right so if you only pay the same with like full-time position if you work half-time you would get half the money so if you want that i think it's definitely doable i know in the agency where i worked in the beginning we had also people especially like women who had their kids or so who had like a like a half half position half-time position so they only worked like half-time it wasn't that nice yeah. to be honest because they missed out on a lot of things i think so too i, I think it's also yeah, so they left there are the, more and more people working yeah. a four week work week which i think is doable but i think ux design or design itself is a very difficult career to have if you only want to work say two days a week or three days a week because it is moving so fast and you it is such high detailed work that requires a lot of thinking time a lot of alignment time with others that i have a hard time imagining how that would work if you're only doing that two days a week because i i mean i already meet two days a week just for meetings or sometimes even three days a week just for meetings and that's not even designing them so i yeah, yeah. i, I I don't know. I ha I don't have an example of someone that did that successfully, but I'm not going to say it's not possible. I just don't know the examples of it. Yeah, yeah, good. T totally. I mean, like four weeks prob could work, like leaving out the Friday, but I feel like Fridays are usually more quiet anyways. Um, but yeah, 
if you don't want to work a lot, then UX is probably not the right area to get started with, especially if you're, you are a junior, you need to do a lot of work, I think, especially in the beginning to get all the practice. Um, but later on, if you're switching to freelance, totally do. If you're some kind you can of do master it, like, that can give no these beautiful workshops and charge so much money, oh, yeah. you can like work one day a week and then chill the rest of the week. I think that's the dream that everyone has. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 true. That, that would be like very pricey workshops then like <laughs> but you still can do that for sure but even yeah I mean yeah it depends also on your lifestyle right like if you're moving to Bali or somewhere where it's not that expensive still charge your day rate like your German day rate I think you have an awesome life you don't need to work that much so it depends very much on your lifestyle and what you really want to get out of it if you're really enjoying the work if you hate it um, and that's the thing, like, I feel also projects that are not that fun, usually you get a lot of money, um, but you, you need to decide, like, what's important to you, I think yeah. those are very, like, yeah, lifestyle decisions, um, not that easy, but you will figure that out, I think, on the way, um, and it's always good to take some breaks, even if you're working, or when you're a freelancer, to have, like, a month off or so, less social media, less work, and really recharge i think this is very important i also need to do that uh, but, but yeah that's very important in general <laughs> good as well wow we discussed a nice. lot of different topics i hope that we could answer some of the questions and um, that people had i don't think we could answer all of them but i also saw that there w were a lot of questions um, yeah. but i hope nevertheless that people learn something from this i really enjoyed talking with you patricia also learn about how it's like to work me as too. a freelancer it's very different <laughs> but it's it's not that bad so if if it sounds bad <laughs> yeah, i can imagine that nice, so. more freedom <laughs> <laughs> more a lot of freedom a lot of work but also a lot of freedom yeah so it's a nice thing i can't um complain yeah, honestly, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was really nice talking to you and really interesting conversation. So I also very much enjoyed it. And yeah, um, I mean, I'm always happy to do a second round. If you are ever, you know, in the mood for a second one, I'm always up for it. And yes, yeah, I hope I to mean, see we're you We're basically in neighbors. Berlin. You that live in a neighboring nice. neighborhood. So uh, we'll, we'll grab a coffee. We need okay. to do that. Right now I'm in Switzerland, <laughs> but I will be back in Berlin soon. <laughs> yeah, but I will be back soon and then... Um, cool. All right. For the rest, thanks for joining. Awesome. I'm going to prepare dinner. I'm very hungry. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll see each other soon. <laughs> Same. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for being here. and Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. For joining. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for watching the live recording. Let me know how you like it. And if you want to say hello on Instagram, feel free to do it. I always love to chat. So um, yeah, just say hello, uh, not only to me, but also to Maureen. I think she's also very happy to get your feedback about um, the live stream and about your thoughts. So yeah, feel free to just um, drop a message. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully see you next time.